Hello everyone, uh, today we're going to talk about injectable drug errors. Have we learned enough? My name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh and I am a consultant in anesthesia and I work in Liverpool, UK. Last year in July, uh, BMJ actually published a meta-analysis and that said that around 1 in 20 patients are affected by preventable harm. It also stated that uh, most of the drug-related errors account for nearly 9.3 billion access charges in the US. And if you look at equivalent in the UK, this equated to around appointing 3,500 nurses. I've also given the uh, value of this 9.3 billion in uh, rupees. So this equates to 930 crore rupees uh, for our Indian uh, listeners. <clears throat> in the same uh, journal, uh, there are also editorials on it, and one of these editorial was called Preventable Harm, Getting the uh, Measure Right. And it went on to say that healthcare is not as safe as it should be. So 20 years ago, there was a publication called R is Human, uh, which was looking into people being more open about drug errors, uh, reporting openly and learning from errors. But in this article, they go on to say that even after 20 years, we have almost 12% of patients who experience some form of harm associated with the healthcare, and 50% of these is uh, preventable. And it raises serious concerns about safety of health systems and goes on to ask us whether uh, the health system leaders, doctors, patients are able to do anything about it. How would they interpret this, uh, you know, the data or uh, these conclusions of these meta-analysis? The Time of India uh, was uh, quick enough to pick this up and it uh, created an infograph uh, called Medical Errors in which said that uh, uh, drug errors were the third largest killers in the US and it said that the publication had mentioned that globally an estimated 140,000 uh, people died in 2000, uh, 2013 from adverse effects of medical treatment. And that the Howard University study estimated that 43 million uh, medical injuries occurred globally. And in India, this was around 5.2 million. I don't know how they actually uh, got this figure for India, where there is no uh, centralized reporting system. Uh, so there we go. And, uh, and they, uh, from the Royal College of Finance Studies, uh, Peter Brennan uh, you know, uh, had his tweet on this and he said that uh, researchers had looked at around uh, 337,000 episodes uh, of uh, drug errors and found that 1 in 20 patients uh, experienced preventable harm. And uh, this was very common in the intensive care and uh, during surgery, that means in the theater setting. And he goes on to say that uh, we need to look at uh, the human factors. The human factors need to be embedded across the healthcare systems. Uh, in the Twitter, uh, just a few months uh, before the, this publication, BMJ, uh, this uh, young doctor had actually written about uh, drug errors and uh, uh, probably this is must be actually uh, from somewhere. It looks like a, a snapshot of a publication or a presentation. <clears throat> And it uh, mentions the BGA article from 2017 by Kaufman, uh, Drug Safety in Pediatric Anesthesia, uh, which states that uh, in anesthetics, the one in 133 uh, patients uh, can suffer from medication error. And this is all uh, self-reported data. So <clears throat> probably there's a lot of other data which is not reported. And one in 20 drug administrations uh, have an error. And one third of these can lead to harm. This is similar to pediatrics. But in pediatrics, is one in two anesthetics actually have drug errors. So it's a lot more significant in the pediatric setup. 
And life-threatening drug errors uh, are more common in pediatrics than adults, and this is related to the age and weight. And we know that in pediatrics, uh, when we administer a drug, <clears throat> we administer them according to the weight. Uh, they require different, uh, you know, dilutions. And so they, uh, you know, the chances of error actually increases uh, in these patients. Whereas in adults, we tend to actually take uh, the usual dosage. Everybody will actually uh, have a 20 ml of profile. Uh, if you need more, we will give more, but that's what everybody actually gets. Uh, some might get 15 ml out of the 20 ml range. Others might require uh, another uh, 5 to 10 ml extra. So, but in the end, you just have a big syringe, small syringe uh, loaded up for patients. Unlike in pediatrics, where you have to be careful with the uh, drug dosage. So where do we go wrong? <clears throat> okay. uh, so this is my, uh, sorry, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is uh, my theater where this is my trolley, you saw uh, the labels. Uh, the drugs are, um, you know, stored in different compartments. So we have the emergency drugs. Uh, times we also have uh, pre-filled syringes. And uh, then we uh, just take the drugs and uh, uh, put it into a tray uh, with the dalliance, different size syringes, drawing up needles, labels. And uh, we drop them up according to the dilutions, like ephedrine is diluted in 10 mLs. So 30 milligrams, so three milligrams per ml of ephedrine is drawn up. Whereas if you look at uh, metraminol, we need 20 ml. Uh, so it's diluted in 20 ml of saline. And you need to do that one by one. Okay. But there are then other drugs like uh, glycoparolate, which does not require any dilution <coughs> at all. So glycoparolate. Uh, this is 200 microgram per ml and this is 600 micrograms and this can be loaded uh, directly and they are now kept in a separate tray so they are not mixed uh, with the anesthesia uh, drugs so this is the way we actually load our drugs so basically as an anesthetist you are selecting your drug okay so you need to be careful in what you're selecting you tend to draw them up, you dilute them, you label them. Okay, everything is in your hands. And you're the one who are going to administer this drug to the patients. And some of the drugs are actually serious stuff. So in a newsletter published by Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, a letter to editor mentioned that anesthesia providers do not always read the labels. Right. They do not read the label because they think they have time only to recognize the color, shape, or size of the intended drug or syringes. And it's very common, uh, people actually have written this on our group. They said, I actually have 20 ml uh, syringe for thypentone or propofol, uh, 5 ml syringe for atacurium, uh, 2 ml syringe for the fentanyl, 10 ml syringe for morphine, and that's all. I don't need to label the syringes. I've never made a mistake in my whole life. So oh, there we go. So this is another uh, guy who uh, tweets a uh, lot about drugs. And these are tweets from 2014. And they say, all the companies deliberately trying to make us make mistakes. And uh, so these are two vials. Uh, one of his ondan citron, another is of alfantino. They look absolutely the same, and I think they do actually come from the same company as well. Uh, so they're saving on uh, just having a, a single uh, type of print uh, and fonts uh, on that. So you can actually mistake a antiemetic uh, with a very strong uh, opioid. He also actually then uh, discusses about the other. Uh, you know, drugs which look similar, they come in similar boxes, they are purple. And they also look uh, similar, uh, you know, in appearance. So these are uh, like look-alike drugs. They're not uh, sound-alike, these are look-alike uh, drugs. They're coming in the similar kind of uh, you know, sizes, shapes, colors. 
some more examples of lidocaine or lecithin or tritium coming in now. Uh, again, similar size labels, similar size uh, vials, shapes, okay, and colors as well. So we can make mistake. The same girl retweeted a, uh, you know, uh, from uh, another uh, tweet uh, Matt Turner, and uh, uh, here uh, he actually had uh, looked at fentanyl and succinamethonium. Uh, they come in a similar kind of wires and easy to make a mistake of uh, look alike. And you can see they actually come from the same company. This is from Martindale Pharmacy. Uh, Tim Cook <coughs> from uh, London uh, also tweeted and he said that rate of drug errors is astonishingly uh, low given the similar size and feel of ampules, similar appearance of ampules. And labels, uh, no standardization of labeling by the companies, not by us, uh, lack of safety labeling, again by companies, not by us, and unannounced change of suppliers. This happens all the time with us. So fentanyl may come from a different supplier and it looks just different from what you are used to. Or suddenly the Tracurium actually ampules have changed. They look so different. Sometimes you want the, uh, you know, type, uh, so glass ampules replaced by plastic uh, ampules, you know, so it happens. And it goes on to say that there are plenty of safety designs available, but they aren't used. So what are the suggested solutions? Long back ago, uh, it says in 1992, one of the nurses suggested uh, using barcode readers as used in the airport. And they said that by using that, uh, they were able to reduce dispensing errors by 86%. So this is only talking about dispensing, not administration errors. <coughs> and uh, this was published last year in Anesthesia. And they talk about the haptic device. Haptic device actually uh, give you poor pure reception and uh, touch. So you can actually have a different feel and touch. And uh, when you attach these to the syringes, you know, you won't be able to attach, so you will actually f uh, feel a giveaway every time you give one ml. So they say this can also help in reducing drug errors. In another publication, uh, they looked at the drug trace. You say, okay, we do actually label the drugs. What about the trace? Like if you look at our trace, they are just plain yellow trace, so we just use them. I tend to use kidney trace, you know, disposable kidney trace uh, for keeping our drugs. But some people just actually have, just, uh, you know, throw the drugs into that. So they actually had compartments uh, within the trays, and these compartments were also color-coded. So you have the yellow for your induction agent, the red for your muscle relaxant, orange for your benzodiazepine. There were separate trays for the emergency drugs, that is vasopressors or anticholinergics and the like gray one for local anesthetic. They all should be kept all separately. While researching about safety in drugs, I actually came across this uh, company which actually produces syringes uh, which have color-coded plungers, but they are a bit costly, three uh, pounds, 45 pence uh, for, I think, I assume it's for a set, but it might be for a single syringe. Uh, I didn't actually go into the details of this. <coughs> So the, one of the problems uh, we have is that as anesthetists, uh, we are the only uh, medical personnel who prescribe, uh, secure, uh, prepare, dilute, administer, document medication or anesthesia chart. Okay. And this process uh, takes around 41 steps and in a very short interval uh, time. And these are all happening uh, in real time and uh, autonomously. So you do it yourself and there is no standardization. Nobody will come and actually catch you and say, why did you uh, dilute the uh, mitraminol in, in 20 mLs, not in a liter bag? Or why did you actually load the morphine in 20 mLs, not in 10 mLs? You can do it. Nobody actually uh, can question you. <clears throat> So there are six factors that can lead to uh, drug errors. They can be sound alike, look alike, local expectation, okay, where you keep your loaded syringes, where you keep your drugs, 
uh, where you actually have like for example all our uh, you know morphine fentanyl alfentanyl and uh, ketamine everything is locked up in a cd cupboard whereas other drugs are freely available uh, just in the trolleys trust sometime you will actually let your juniors prepare drugs for you and you assume that what they are doing they are doing right so they are picking up the right drug loading the right drug diluting the right drug okay and then there are flow, uh, workflow expectation and workflow trust. Okay, you're, um, there you have to run the list efficiently. You need to finish the list in time. Okay, and uh, you're trusting that whatever job is given to someone, they are doing it accordingly. Okay. There was another publication in Anesthesia, and uh, they actually talk about tool steps in making uh, the uh, drug administration safer. <clears throat> and they talk about that the incidence of uh, mistakes in drug administration is almost uh, 1 in 133. Uh, this I have quoted before. Uh, this is from the BG article from 2017. So uh, the steps, 12 steps, the first one is obviously that uh, you need to handle one drug at a time. Uh, this need to be away from the distraction, so you need to quarantine yourself. Okay, you don't want anyone coming and tell, oh, I want to talk to you about the next case or doc, do you want to have a coffee? It's been a long day or, or, or it's a Monday morning, you're not feeling too good. Let's have a cup of coffee. No, no, you need to be completely uh, of distraction. <clears throat> then you need to check the drug twice. You check it before you load it. You check it after you load it. And if someone can check it with you, then nothing like it. Uh, use correct labels actually and have a standardized way of uh, keeping your syringes like I said I have a separate tray for emergency drugs separate tray for my anesthetic drugs and separate tray for local anesthetic keep them away and do not drop the medication you do not need for example you don't need to drop uh, neostigmine until the very end okay. and <clears throat> The, uh, obviously, the most uh, dangerous drug uh, in theaters is the neuromuscular blocker. And you need to actually have it uh, in, a, in a red syringe and uh, drop the whole ampule so that nobody, uh, you know, uh, be mistakenly use it for as a dalliant or mistake it for any other drug. And don't, even if you have finished the whole uh, you know the case and you have an empty syringe with that don't drop your uh, reversal in your muscle relaxant syringe there can be some residual muscle relaxant in the uh, syringe okay and as i've explained uh, always uh, you know segregate drugs so, so you have your emergency drugs separately local anesthetic separately and the drugs which are not necessary separately for example if you're doing a vascular list you don't want heparin mixed up with your anesthetic drugs keep it separate tray and make sure the drugs are actually flush so if you don't have a running uh, drip make sure that you use saline to flush the drug we have had cases where uh, you know a can of patient came with a cannula uh, from ward that was used for induction uh, succinthonia was used and then another cannula was placed for using fluids this kind of cannula was left <coughs> You know uh, without use and the patient went back to the ward the cannula from the theater got uh, you know uh, tissued so they decided to use the cannula from the ward and as soon as they actually flushed that patient went apneic because there was residual succinthonia within the uh, cannula you know dead space of cannula a uh, patient became apneic and uh, hypoxic <coughs> so critical incident yeah and if such incident happen, they need to be reported. Uh, we have yellow cards uh, on the wards or back of the BNF. Uh, you need to report those critical incidents. In 2017, uh, WHO came out with a publication called Medication Without Harm. And they said that we need to reduce the level of severe avoidable harm related to medication by 50% over five years globally. And they wanted that this challenge should aim to make improvement at each stage of medication process, whether it is prescribing, dispensing, uh, administrating, uh, monitoring, uh, using, okay, whatever 
So administration is part of this uh, whole, uh, yeah, you know, challenge, and uh, thank you reduces by fifty percent. So if you look at health expenditure per capita, uh, it varies quite a lot. It's uh, very small in some countries, and others it can be huge. But it is said that almost 10 to 15 percent of healthcare budget uh, could be consumed because of uh, this drug-related, uh, uh, you know, incidences or adverse effects. And 10 percent may not mean much for countries which have a huge per capita budget. Uh, but in uh, you know countries where this per capita budget is very small, it can mean a lot. Really. I've already explained to you that uh, the factors why uh, we actually have these drug-related problems, and uh, uh, the only thing which I didn't mention was that the administration errors are actually quite frequent, uh, with error rates per dosing ranging from 2.4 to 11 percent. Okay, and this has been in various articles like by Dean in 1995, Taxes by 1999, Barker 2002, Tess, Tessar in 2003, 2005. And all I've actually said, this is the usual rate, but it varies between 2.4 to 11.1%. <clears throat> and if you look at the adverse drug events, uh, all, all events can actually cost around 5.6 million, and it's almost 50% of that. That is 2.8 million for preventable adverse drug events. And this is the cost for a, a 700 bed at teaching hospital. So from this, they can extrapolate. So if there are, uh, say, uh, you know, uh, 10, 700 bed at hospital in a, in a county, you can imagine the amount of money that is, uh, you know, annual cost for these kind of uh, events, especially the preventable events. Okay, that's not good. And also, uh, the same thing was uh, mentioned in a publication in 2020, uh, European Journal of Hospital Pharmacy. They looked at what would be the cost uh, for a single person, and uh, they actually estimated this could be anywhere from 4,000 to around 6,000 uh, euros. And uh, the four most common types of errors are labeling errors, uh, which we have. Incorrect dosing, more common in pediatrics, but can happen in adults as, as well. Documentation errors, medication omission or failure errors. This probably happened more on the ward. But you can see they range from anywhere from 20 uh, to 24%, so, so 17 to 24%. So uh, that's quite significant. And we've had uh, quite a few uh, you know, discussions on uh, uh, drug errors uh, on our group, uh, Poonam did a survey in uh, November 2019, and she presented this on the uh, in the ISA meeting. Okay. There were a lot of discussion, but what we see from these discussions is that there is always a error which can be contributed to look alike, sound alike drug. Okay, Lassa kind of errors, lots of them. We had. I think uh, some errors uh, have been fatal, uh, especially uh, where the drug was injected into the spinal cord, and uh, we come across the tranexamic acid instead of local anesthetic in uh, quite a few, uh, you know, instances. There are errors related to trust, where the juniors uh, or the nurses uh, were asked to like, load up a particular drug and they thought you actually said something different uh, to what you actually wanted. Uh, so the trust factor actually also uh, comes in here. And uh, this haven't really, despite the fact that uh, we have had labels for years and years, uh, and uh, they have been standardized, there are still shortage of uh, drug labels in uh, uh, countries like India even though it is actually said that it is one of the standards for everything. Just this uh, March, uh, Hemant uh, posted uh, this article from Updates in Anesthesia. Uh, these are published uh, by the World Federation of Anesthesia. And this was about intrathecal tranexamic acid during spinal cirrhosis section. These are actually really sad ones.
Rajesh posted about this uh, two drugs which have same trade name, Mid Medzol, Medzol, one of these, Pantoprazole, which is a PPI, and other is a benzodiazepine. Now, you don't want to mix them up, isn't it? Dangerous stuff. Uh, this is uh, two drugs. One is a hypertensive, whereas other is used for treating hypertension. Similar ampules, uh, similar kind of font, again, produced by the same company. So that's there. Uh, Nagmani actually uh, posted this uh, picture of uh, the wilds. And again, they're made for the same company, same kind of fonts, uh, same color caps. Okay. Can mistake. Somebody posted this uh, ampules, which are actually red labels. They do look different size, but they may be different in size, but they are, again, they do look similar. And uh, when they're kept separately, it's easy to actually mix them up. Uh, Romy actually said that, okay, yes, fine, we do actually can uh, have the right drug, but then we can also have a wrong dilution. Uh, so looking at the, uh, you know, uh, selen comes in this uh, plastic uh, ampules, and there are other drugs also which come in plastic ampules, and they all like, uh, you know, uh, clear like water. So you can easily mistake uh, them and use the wrong dilution. And it's not that it's not happened. It has happened before. Some uh, boxes have similar, uh, you know, they are look absolutely similar and in a, in a rush. You can obviously mix them up. So one is metraminol, uh, a vasopressor, or there's a magnesium sulfate, which has totally opposite effect. I've been talking about drug errors since uh, 2012. Uh, that is a time when we uh, this group was started. And uh, I had suggested a few ideas as well, how we can uh, reduce the errors. Uh, one of the errors which Vikas Chavla uh, did uh, mention about is, rather a, a solution was that, uh, should we not actually have magnifying lens uh, in the theaters, in the anesthesia rooms, uh, so that we can read the small prints, especially for people like us, uh, oldies like us, uh, who actually and now we need uh, reading glasses. So uh, it is uh, a, you know, have a recurring. I also actually publish about the Justin Hope, uh, you know, foundation. Uh, I know the mother of this 11 year old, uh, the 11 year old who died because of uh, wrong dilution drug given for treating hypertension. And uh, yes, Justin would have been a young lad now. So this is a very sorry story. I said, I did suggest ways of uh, making it safer. Uh, there were other people suggesting other ideas, how sanitization is uh, very, very important. And um, again, uh, like I said, it's a recurring thing because drug errors keep happening. We keep discussing about them. And whatever have maybe the advances in anesthesia, we have not been able to prevent them at all. Eight years later, uh, present times, I actually posted uh, something uh, in June. And uh, this was uh, you know, triggered by a publication uh, which was titled Six Medication Error Stories that made headline. And one of the uh, first few one was a you know, mix-up, look-alike, sound-alike drug, Atricurium versus Midazolam. Yeah, so it is still happening. And this was from U.S., Again, it generated same kind of discussions that we keep seeing it. There were some solutions mentioned, uh, like uh, I think Pallavi actually mentioned about this uh, uh, Pixis uh, system that has uh, drugs. Those are already pre-filled by the pharmacy, and it's like a vending machine. And uh, but then these are costly, uh, you know, things. Uh, again, I mean. Uh, one of the things which actually came out uh, from, again, this discussion is that uh, do we actually need uh, more funds? Should we not be talking about investing more into safety? If there are going to be one, you know, drug error in 133 administrations, it does not mean that patient actually has to lose life. It can happen that it can lead to cancellation of operation, patient ending up on the intensive care, 
or patient uh, requiring uh, surgery again. So these errors we need to look at okay we may not be able to eliminate them completely but I think we can still reduce them to a significant level. One of the errors which has actually caused a lot of harm to patients is mixing up of uh, tranoxamic acid and local anesthetics. So confusing tranoxamic acid for a local anesthetic. It has been written extensively about it, has been written, it has been published. And uh, but what they keep saying is say, oh, read the labels carefully, it's about labels. Label the syringes carefully, it's about labels. Check the labels again with second person, it is about labels. So you're talking about label, label, label. Okay, they also actually go say, okay, maybe we should actually have barcode readers as well. Okay, so in another, uh, you know, publication, uh, they looked at why this is happening. You know, we are, why are we confusing the tranoxamic acid with uh, local anesthetic? And again, it's about label, failure to check uh, ampule label. It was about look-alike drug. It tranoxamic acid and can do not sound same. Okay, so it is not about sound alike. It is about look alike. So similar appearance of ampule, four ml ampules, five ml ampules, uh, glass ampule, similar kind of fonts used. Okay, so it's again about label. So everything comes up to label. Uh, this is my friend Arvind, and uh, he is. Uh, written a uh, uh, review, no, editorial in anesthesia last year in April, and uh, they call uh, this uh, uh, spinal transfer acid as a nuclear in town. And again, they talk about double-checking the ampule, reading the label. Like, okay, So everything comes on to the label. Okay. And we had, again, discussion on this. People actually talked about why it's happening how it causes uh, problems, seizures, how we can uh, treat it, recognize it. Okay. And all, one of the things I had written in 2015 is that less is more. I said instead of having too many syringes, you limit your number of syringes. Do not unnecessarily prepare your drugs beforehand. Okay. Try to only prepare the drugs which you need. Uh, uh, so what are the other solutions? Uh, uh, so Peter Brenner actually talked about human factors. And it's a fact the value of human factors and system engineering for improving patient safety is not uh, yet uh, realized. So it is under-realized, is underutilized. And uh, there have been publications uh, where people have talked about using RF, RIFD-based uh, technology. Uh, this was way back from 2008 uh, days. These RFD, RFD tags are very small. They can be embedded in your smart cards. It can be embedded in patient uh, bracelets. Uh, and um, they can uh, have a lot of information on these drugs. Uh, as far as administration of drugs are concerned, it's very difficult to incorporate them for every syringe. Uh, this will actually increase the cost exorbitantly. So it's not a very easy one. Okay. So looking at human factors, and uh, there was publication in the Quality of Care Journal in Health Affairs, and they have actually uh, mentioned in how uh, medication safety uh, we can use the human factors, how we can design uh, you know better and safer. Uh, interfaces between the ordering and uh, prescribing and delivering uh, the drugs uh, so but they did not give any uh, good examples how for how we can uh, do that uh, these guys from Singapore actually uh, have tried to introduce a system uh, where uh, once the syringes are labeled uh, using a commercially available uh, label maker and then they have a barcode reader and have a system that only when the uh, barcode is read, uh, then uh, this device, which is shown on the right upper hand corner, uh, will allow uh, you to administer the drug. So it prevents in administering the wrong drug. But it requires, again, 
a whole system of uh, labels being generated, that information being uh, fed uh, to the computers and having a barcode reader. So you have to actually uh, go to the barcode reader every time you want to actually give a, a drug. Uh, so that's what. And uh, we normally use uh, 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 just a 1D linear uh, barcodes, but other type of barcodes uh, can also be actually used. And this is an example of a syringe of uh, two opioids. And you can actually see the way they are actually labeled are also different. You can see that in fentanyl, the last three letters are in capital. Uh, they are like called Longman letters. And they have a linear barcode. Uh, hydromorphone, again, the first five letters are in capital. They are larger than the normal font. And uh, they also have a barcode that can be read. And this is the uh, Codonix uh, machine uh, that reads the uh, labels. So it scans the labels on the uh, ampules and wires. And that produces a label that you can stick onto the syringes. Uh, this requires multiple systems. So you, it is labor intensive and time consuming. So you have to have, uh, you know, barcode, read the barcode, and that will produce a label. And then uh, you need a separate scanner, again, handheld scanner that can communicate uh, with your uh, electronic note system. Uh, so it is uh, quite bulky. But in the end, even if you have the right drug, rather you can still pick up a wrong syringe and you can still administer a wrong drug uh, to the patient. So we are still stuck at all this and we are still relying on the labels. The labels are our uh, you know, savior. We need to make sure that we load the right drug into the right syringe, label it properly and administer it properly. So, okay. We need some simpler and robust systems uh, which uh, can be easily used, uh, not too costly, uh, but still you know, provide us uh, that uh, safety net within the system. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, here we reach the question time.